All right, everybody, we are back at long last with Dr. Joshua Sidjuati. He has a new book out, relatively new. It's still new, right? I think as long as it's like within the last year, it's still it's still considered new. And uh, Josh, I have to I have to thank you for this. It's not only a tremendous philosophical volume; it has officially replaced all my weightlifting equipment. <laughs> So now I can do it. I can do it all with this, right? I can do the overhead pressing. I can uh, sharpen up my analytic metaphysics. Wow. Um, and yeah, dude. So congratulations. It's an awesome book. Like I said, I've been I've been spending a lot of time with it. You can see it's all dog eared and stuff like that. Uh, I've been getting a ton of value out of it. And I'm looking forward to chatting with you about some of the yeah. contents today. How are you? Yeah, I'm very good. Thank you. Thank you so much for inviting me back. I really do love your, your podcast. Your, obviously, your conversational styles. It's really great, and you you produce great content. So thanks a lot for inviting me back. Um, yeah, it's a it's a pleasure. So uh, the book is it's it's really great, and there's so much in there we can't cover it all. But hopefully, this conversation will encourage people to grab a copy of it. Uh, one thing that that struck me, Josh, is like you you have so much great work out already. You, you you publish a ton, and I thought your book would have been awesome, even if it was just a compilation of a lot of your already published work. But so far as I can tell, this is a lot of new stuff in here and like you develop and refine some stuff that you've already, you know, published and talked about. So um, just give us a little bit of background. Like what was, what was your, what was your goal with this book? Uh, clearly it was not just intended to be a compilation of stuff you already had out, which yeah. again would have been fine. It seems like yeah. you really wanted to move forward in a, in a, you know, in many different respects. So let's set the stage and then we can dive into some of the, the content from there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I had the, uh, well, a lot of my work is, is touching on quite a, <laughs> quite um, a wide range of different areas of philosophy, religion, and philosophical theology. Um, but from the beginning, I always had a great interest in natural theology. Yeah. And so I started off my, one of my papers, um, one of my, one of my really, um, fairly earliest papers were, was on grounding of the existence of God. Mm -hmm. um, and then I did a few others related to that. I did one on fundamentality. And I just felt that there was, when I was writing those papers, I felt that there was a great need to sort of shift the conversation from in natural theology, from just focusing on specific, let's say, data that we find within the scientific realm or scientifically confirmable data. So that would be things that we find within, you know, let's say, cosmological discussions or discussions about teleolo theology and, and talking about things like fine tuning yeah. and then sort of moral arguments and things like that. So things that you, you generally hear in natural theology, if you were to open up a philosophy of religion textbook, you'll probably just see arguments, cosmological, teleological, all these sort of things. And they, those are great arguments and they have their, their merits. But I felt that there was, when, when I was sort of doing my, my research around grounding, doing my research around fundamentality, and then also my research around things like the Trinity, which was not wholly related to this, but I was having to deep, um, deep dive into metaphysical sort of areas. I realized that there's a lot of concepts, a lot of assumptions, a lot of theses that can be accounted for within a theistic framework. Which right. hasn't been done so um, um so far, and so when I was looking at these, I, I I discovered things like you know when I was researching, discovered things you know about uh, fundamentality, about essences, grounding, powers, mm -hmm. all those sort of things that I look at in the book, and I was realizing that there's not a lot of discussion about theism when when we are accounting for the, the explanation for why these things exist or why we take right. this to be um, important with metaphysics. So my my sort of um, push into this area of writing this book was just realizing that there's so many different areas of metaphysics where I think theism has a voice that needs to be heard. Um, and I just felt, yeah, I just said, I, I want to go as deep as I can and research the, the widest range as I can and see what I can, I can sort of do with my theistic hypothesis. Yeah, that's great. So, you know, your book, um, I, I'm, I'm, your book I'm reading right now, uh, alongside another book called the, the moral universe. I don't know if you've seen this one come out through, through Oxford. Cuneo uh, is one of the authors mm -hmm. and they are, um, you know, they're, they're offering an account of a sort of robust moral realism through an essentialist thesis, right? They'll say, well, you know, it's just, it's, it's certain properties. Uh, it's just of their nature to be prohibited or restricted or whatever. And I think it's actually a pretty good account and it just, but they never, so far as I haven't finished a book, but I think they just kind of stay neutral in the higher order question of, well, why are these sort of essences around in the first place or what sort of, greater metaphysical picture would anticipate a world with this sort of essentialist structure. And that's where I thought, oh, this is this is kind of where Sidjuati's, you know, argument could kind of step in. So 
it, maybe that's a good way to kind of uh, help you to explain your methodology a little bit, yes. if you don't mind. Like, what what is your approach here yeah. that you're taking to to make the case for classical yes. theism in your book? Right? Yeah. So the the approach that I adopt is a famous one that a lot of people hear of: inference to the best explanation. But I adopt a specific form of that, which was put forward by a philosopher called Peter Lipton. Mm -hmm. And he's very famous for sort of redeveloping the inference to the best explanation model by recasting it as not as inference to the likeliest explanation of the data, but inference to the loveliest explanation. Yeah. And he believes that that's the type of explanation that we need to put forward. Any data that we're looking at, and specifically he put this forward in the scientific context, but any data that we're looking at, we are looking for the loveliest explanation, the one that increases um, our understandings to the deepest level. That is the one that we should take to be the best explanation because loveliness is a symptom of likeliness. So the loveliest explanation is the one that's going to be the likeliest. So I adopt his framework, but then I resituate it within a metaphysical context. And so I say then, um, let's take this framework, which is widely um, applied within the scientific context, inference of the best explanation, and conceiving it in the Liptonian way through a loveliest explanation. Mm -hmm. But then there's further work that needs to be done in redeveloping this methodology. Um, firstly, what does it mean for an explanation to be lovely? Now, Lipton believed that it's, it's to do with theoretical virtues. Mm -hmm. So the loveliest explanation is the one that exhibits the, the you know, certain amount of theoretical virtues. However, Lipton in his work doesn't really go into a great amount of depth about what the nature of these virtues are. And so I had to do further work in sort of combining this methodology with that of, a, of an individual called Michael Keyes, who wrote a very good paper called Systematizing Theoretical Virtues, mm -hmm. where he basically listed and went in a great amount of depth of all the theoretical virtues that are normally taken to be important within a scientific explanatory context. Right. And so what he did is that he categorized these into four main virtue classes. So you have the evidential virtue class, the coherential virtue class, the aesthetic virtue class, and the diachronic virtue class. And so I was then sort of adopting this and saying, the loveliest explanation is one that, that uh, posits an explanation that exhibits all of the virtues within these virtue classes, or as many as it can. Now, what I then do, a further redevelopment, is that I then have to drop one of the virtue classes, which is the diachronic virtue classes, mm -hmm. because I basically make a division between a scientific explanation and a metaphysical one. Right. Metaphysical explanations are trying to give an explanation about the fundamental nature and structure of reality, while scientific ones are looking about the, na the natural structure of reality mm -hmm. and how to make sense of that. And so when um, you're giving a metaphysical explanation, a lot of the time it's going to be retrodictive instead of predictive. So you're going to be trying to explain data that you already possess or that already occurs, has already occurred, sorry, um, instead of trying to predict phenomena that's going to appear in the future. Right. So, yeah, so this means then I drop the diachronic virtues. Mm -hmm. And then what I say is a lovely explanation is one, and so this is the definition I give. A lovely explanation is one that's a coherent explanation, so that exemplifies the coherential virtues. It's a coherent explanation that um, is uh, minimizes uh, theoretical commitments. Mm -hmm. So that means it then... Um, holds to some of the aesthetic virtues. It maximizes ex explanation, so it um, exhibits all of the evidential virtues, yeah. and it unifies all theoretical postulations. So just repeating that again, a lovely explanation is one that is coherent, minimizes theoretical commitments, maximizes explanations, and unifies all theoretical postulations. So that's the explanation that I try to use. And I try to say, well, what is the best explanation we can put forward for the metaphysical data I look, I look to with that sort of... Um, methodology again. yeah okay i love it let's let's dive right in then to your account of theism because i think this will help us to see how um theism and we'll get to the explanation uh part here in a bit at least initially can satisfy some of these some of these uh yeah. virtues right so uh, you have a very interesting way of making use of contemporary trope theory which yes. I definitely want to get into because I have a, a number of, of questions there and I know yes. we discussed this a little bit uh, yeah. before but Spell that out for us, at least as, as, you know, as simply as you can. I know there's a lot uh, to that yes. and how you see this as satisfying. Uh, the thing that I think is going to be of interest to a lot of people here would be the criteria of not just simplicity, yeah. but unity, too. Because that's something that has always struck me is, you know, I, I look at these other sort of competing uh, hypotheses. And in some sense, they do have an element of simplicity, maybe not always at the fundamental level, but they always just seem disparate lacking a sort of 
Yeah, right. That 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 one simple first principle that I think theism so elegantly provides. So so talk to talk to us about that a little bit, Joshua. Yeah. So the um, the specific thesis I look at is uh, what I call trope theoretic theism, and theism at the basic level is just a claim that there is a god. But then you have to fill out what it means ontologically for there to right. be a god. The way that I conceive of that through trope theoretic theism is to take God to be a maximal power trope. Now, I used to use a term, so this is for people who might have followed my work, I used to use a term omnipotence trope, mm -hmm. but I prefer now to use the term maximal power trope just because I feel it, again, fits with more of the usage of the term power within a trope theoretic context. So anyways, I see God as a maximal power trope. Now, a trope is an entity which was posited by individuals such as D.C. Williams and um, Keith Campbell. So these are sort of the main um, yeah. components of this classical trope theory where they take a trope to be an entity which is an abstract particular nature. Now, it's quite important that you go with that definition of a trope because within the literature, there are different individuals that define tropes in different ways. So, yeah. for example, you'll have someone like Anna Sophia Morin who will take a trope, um, and she's quite influential, so she'll take a trope to be a particularized property. And that's not what I'm saying. I'm going with the classical view where it's an abstract particular nature. Okay. Um, now... Yeah, I don't know if you want me to break down what that yeah, means. Yeah, well, let's let's pause here because this. I mean, look, we're going to go into the, the deep end real quick, but that's fine. Um, so my one of the holdups that I have had with with trope theory, and the question I'm going to get to Josh is how you see trope theory fitting with the essentialism that you defend, right? Yeah. Um, because my understanding is part of the reason you want to use trope theory is so we're not talking about anything too weird, right? That's kind of the idea, right? right? We're not throwing anything totally new into our ontological soup, right? You know, there's, there's already a background of people talking about this. I have to say just personally, that concern has always been far less of a concern uh, to me, but I understand why it is a concern for people. Um, my my one issue with, with at least classical trope theory is, I guess I have two issues. One is that um, a lot of people think of tropes as just like little substances, right? Um, but if you're kind of like a traditional, uh, you know, why do things have the character they do, I guess, is the question that, that a lot of people are trying to answer, yeah. right? And if you're, you know, an Aristotelian and you're a constituent ontologist, then you think that I have the character that I do because um, I'm comprised of incomplete entities like matter and form right, that supplement each other to form the one complete entity that is me, a substance, right? Whereas tropes is kind of a form of like classical bundle theory where there's these like little substances that like have a compresence relation, yeah. right? Yeah. So initially it seems those two commitments of like a kind of traditional essentialism and, and, and that understanding of trope theory seem at odds, right? And then you could throw whatever issues you have of like general bundle theory, which I have a lot, right? <laughs> So you see the kind of the, the, the direction I'm moving with uh, some of my – not even concerns because I know there's a lot of different understandings of trope theory out there. But how are you thinking about it? Do you see tropes as as little substances? Because um, I'm much more inclined towards, the, I guess, the traditional Aristotelian view, right, where there's property instances, yes. right? Um, yes. Could your account work as well with that understanding? And, and yeah, just however you want to take that. Go for it, right? Yes, yeah, so – one thing that I'll say at the beginning is that classical trope theory is not, um, it doesn't have an essential feature, bun uh, bundle theory. Yeah. So bundle theory is an additional thesis that is added on. A lot of trope theorists will also affirm it. Uh, yes, right. It board, but it's not necessary to do that. Mm -hmm. um, so where I sort of put my own position is I affirm that God is a trope, but I'm, I, I'm of the position that I'm open to be um, you know, proven wrong, but I'm of the position that God, there, there is only a singular trope within you do within reality and that is interesting god. yeah yeah so um god is this singular trope um and then everything else as you see sort of the the metaphysics that i construct as you go through the evidential sort of um second part of the mm -hmm. of the work um i affirm uh, lowe's four category ontology so i believe in yep. universals um i believe in substances that are you know particular objects and they're not constituated uh, by compresent um uh, um, tropes. Uh, so I don't utilize trope in trope, sorry, in uh, doing anything in sort of my construction of reality. So yeah. I, I sort of affirm more of an Aristotelian view of reality, but at the fundamental level, I'm happy to say that there is a trope. That we There's just one. Like. There's just one yeah. trope for you. Yeah, but it could be. So my, my view is, is the view that I, I hold to can be that um, it's flexible enough to say God is a trope and everything else is a trope. 
you can hold to that. Or it could be that there's just one trope, which is God, and then everything else is, you know, constructed in the Aristotelian manner. Um, and that's where I sort of move towards more, because I see that there is expansionary power in taking God to be a trope, but you lose expansionary power when you take other entities to be a trope, and you gain expansionary power by holding to an Aristotelian view. So I yes. sort of mix and match uh, with my ontology. Um, but it's not, again, my view is not wedded to anyone. You can hold to bundle theory if you want to, in my view, um, or you don't have to. But me personally, I would say that I'm happy to say there's just a singular trope that exists, who identifies God, and then he's a ground of everything else um, that we can strike within sort of an Aristotelian manner. Yeah. Okay, that's that's great. That's actually really helpful to me because I'm, I'm very sympathetic to the general Aristotelian ontology and i think you actually did a wonderful like your 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 section on essentialism was great i think you did an amazing job not just summarizing the literature but making the case for it and uh so in fact maybe that's a good place to kind of start to see how you're uh how you how you make the case right because you you defend essentialism uh and then you say okay well we need a you know a theory to help make sense of this like why are there essences kind of like you know uh, around yeah. right so let's back up a little bit uh maybe just for people who aren't totally uh familiar i do try to call my podcast philosophy for the people <laughs> not assume too much background knowledge right <laughs> right <laughs> what is the essentialist thesis what are some of its competitors maybe just motivate it a little bit and then yeah. we can talk about how you think it weighs uh in favor of uh your your uh model of theism yeah yeah so the specific form of essentialism that i look at and that i personally affirm is um what is sort of termed like a near aristotelian form which was found in the work of kip fine yep so um i mean you'll find different aristotelians who affirm maybe similar views of, of essences and they sort of share a lot of uh, common concepts but just go with kip fine's view uh just to sort of put it in the context of, of his work um so prior to uh kip fine you had a lot of people who took um uh, essential truths and necessary truths to be identical. So something is essential to some someone if it is necessarily so. So for example, me being a human, that's an essential attribute to myself and um, it's essential to me because it's necessarily so. It couldn't be the case that I wasn't a human and mm -hmm. it still exists. Now, Kit Fine comes in and he basically uh, provides certain counterexamples which show that essences and uh, necessity, uh, sorry, essential truths and necessary truths are not actually identical. Mm -hmm. That actually, at the, what we need to see at sort of the priority level is that es um, essentialism or essences um, are things which ground modality. Which, yes, right. Yeah, this is funny because this is exactly the the uh, critique provide uh, in the moral universe. Right? It's like, yeah, just yeah. you know, uh, even if something is necessary, that's not the sort of explanation yeah. we're looking for we wanted yes. an essentialist explanation yes, yeah. for the necessity of things right yeah i'm totally with you right yeah, yeah. so so he makes that divide between uh, modality and essentialism in the in the case that essence is an essence is what it is to be that thing so mm -hmm. sort of what you find in the work of kit fine ej low and a few others who are building on the work of john locke and then obviously aristotle and a few others as well mm -hmm. is the idea that an essence is what it is to be a thing and it's expressed by some someone's real definition Mm -hmm. So if I want to know what the essence of someone is, I need to define what they are. And so um, what that means then is that when we're defining what someone is, we are really getting to the, the, the nature of that individual. Mm -hmm. And that's what we understand it to be the case. And so whatever it is to be myself or be another entity is then what it is to be necessary. So necessity um, flows from the essence of something, not the essence of something flowing from necessity. So he sort of tries to draw that, that draw that divide. Um, and it, his work, if I'm honest, has been very, very influential. Um, there's been sort of a, a rediscovery in contemporary metaphysics um, of essentialism as a viable thesis. Um, right. So a lot of people are moving away from this sort of modalizing of essences uh, to the view of actually, no, it seems to be the case that we need to understand what it is that what it is to be something and mm -hmm. to try and discover what the real definitions of those things are. Yes. Um, yeah, so it's really, in, in the contemporary literature, Kit Fine has um, provided a very, um, I would say, a, a very convincing task to a lot of metaphysicians that essences need to be taken into account into our metaphysical picture um, mm -hmm. of reality. Right. Uh, and contrast this with um, an anti-essentialist. Yeah. So, picture, um, right. so, for example, I'll, I'll give you uh, an individual who's just completely different from essentialism. Um, so if you look at, like, David Lewis... Yeah. So David Lewis, um, you know, very famous metaphysician, um, his understanding of 
of what it is for something to be necessary is grounded upon a, um, a possible world um, semantics or possible worlds of metaphysics. Right. So what it is, what it means for something to be necessary for myself or for another entity is that that thing is true in a certain possible world or in all possible worlds. Mm -hmm. And then what you have with Lewis in particular, um, who, with a lot of people not following him, is the idea that he concretizes um, the possible worlds in that they are actually real entities existing um, in the pluriverse. Um, but yeah, so his view would be necessity is grounded upon um, possibilities, um, mm -hmm. sorry, in the form of possible worlds. And so we don't need to understand the nature of things in order to understand what is necessary of them. Yeah. Um, so he would take that view of actually possible worlds are, are the ways in which we are to express and also understand what it is to be necessary, what it is to be possible. With essentialism, uh, modality, is, as I said, is grounded upon the essence of an individual. What is necessary and what is possible for that individual is what is allowed or, or permitted by um, their specific essence. Yeah. Um, so, yeah, so um, just, just the last bit on this. Um, through Kit Fine's work, you actually see, a, a, again, a lot of a move away from possible world semantics yep. in contemporary literature, because it was very, a while, so it, was, it was sort of the rave in the 90s, and everyone was talking about possible world and all this. Right. Things. Along with flannel, right, yeah. Yeah, yeah, but when you move now into sort of, um, you know, the 21st century, uh, a lot of people are now moving away from possible world semantics. Right. Into, They're doing postmodal metaphysics, right? Yeah, 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 that sort of thing. Into an essentialism or dispositionalism or things like that, where it's more grounded upon the entity instead of these abstract or concrete possible worlds. Yeah, great. Okay, so there's a number of directions we could go from here. We could just work with uh, with that and uh, have you make the case that this is in uh, confirmatory of, of your, of your uh, model of theism. Although I do want to at some point talk about your uh, semi-Aristotelian uh, Platonism as well. So you pick. Which one? Which way do you want to go first? <laughs> Wherever. I'm happy. I'm happy. Whichever one. Um, okay. Um, let's keep building out the your ontology, I guess, because that's just – that's fascinating to me. So one of the issues you bring up with Aristotelianism is an issue that I – interestingly enough, Joshua, and this might – I don't want to get too far afield, is yeah. I actually think this issue – is extremely favorable for theism, but you take it in a slightly different direction. It's the grounding issue, right? The grounding yeah. issue of Aristotelianism. And for people yeah. who aren't familiar with this, it's it actually relates to the notion of incomplete entities that I said before, right? Where you have these uh, Aristotelian substances, and it's not just Aristotelians that have this issue, but this is just one example of, uh, I think most, uh, any constituent ontology that is committed to the notion of incomplete entities has this issue, I think, right? Where you have a form matter complex, but you have this sort of mutual uh, interdependence between these uh, uh, incomplete entities for their completion to actually exist. So, you know, form depends on matter for its individuation, matter depends on form for its configuration. Like, how do you get this whole thing going, right? Right? You have this, uh, so you call it the cycle of priority problem. I think of it as the problem of mutual dependence or interdependence, right? And it's a big problem. I actually think it's a contradictory, I think it's worse than just like a kind of like, paradox i think it i think it has contradictory results right my thought however is that this grounding problem can be used uh you can if you look at the kind of at the at the parts parts right broadly metaphysical parts of these objects neither seems to have the capacity to be parts in virtue of what they are when you kind of look at them as incomplete entities right but they must be parts if you hold a consistent ontology so then I think you can just go looking for something else that supplies that capacity, namely a uh, an extrinsic cause, right? So I actually think you can kind of uh, posit an interesting cosmological argument in that direction. But in, but but you you take a different appro approach. You kind of just modify Aristotelianism to avoid this issue. It's not just you that has done this, and you pick up uh, SAP. So ex explain your, uh, your thinking around here. Build out the problem any further uh, if you think it needs to be, and then um, – Help us help us think with you on this issue. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, just to sort of contextualize this this discussion um, in the, in sort of light of the book. So the just going back to what I was saying about my methodology. So we utilize the inference of the best explanation to try and find out what's the best explanation for a cer certain set of data. Now there are two stages to inference of the best explanation. Stage one is the generation stage, mm -hmm. and stage two is the selection stage. So stage one is the generation stage where you generate all the logically compatible 
um, explanations of the data that we are trying to explain. So these could be a wild array of, of things. Um, and so you generate them and you put them into a pool, which you can call like pool A, which has all of the logically compatible options. Yeah. And then um, what you do is then you filter through the logically compatible options into a pool B. And in pool B, you have all the plausible ones. And then from pool B, that's where you move into stage two. And you then select the, the specific explanation from the pool of all the plausible explanations. Right. So that's what I'm doing in the book. So part one of the book is sort of the generation stage, setting the methodology, then doing the generation stage. Part two is then the selection stage, which yeah. theory. So then just in understanding this in, um, I can't remember which specific chapter, but one of the early chapters, um, I move into this, you know, the generation stage where I'm looking at um, certain data, which is there appears to be non-fundamental entities existing within reality. Yes. And I think most people would say that. So I, I take a weak position, not to say that there are non-fundamental entities, but say that there appears to be non-fundamental entities. And yeah. so then I generate logically compatible frameworks with that specific data. And so the first one is metaphysical foundationalism. Right. Then we have flat worldism, metaphysical flat worldism, metaphysical infinitism, and then metaphysical coherentism. Yeah. So these four frameworks are sort of explanatory frameworks which are logically compatible with the appearance of non-fundamental entities. And so then I need to then filter through them and sort of see which one, which framework should I favor to move on to uh, the stage two analysis. And so what I do then is that I put forward an argument to, um, to try and say that we should favor metaphysical foundationalism. Foundationalism, right. Yeah. Of, yeah, the other ones. Mm -hmm. And so this is where then this sort of ontology comes in because I do an analysis of the other framework. So just sort of putting flat worldism to the side. Um, when I'm looking at infinitism and coherentism, one of the main reasons why I say we shouldn't hold to it is because it lacks evidential value. Um, and the reason why it lacks evidential value is because it cannot explain actually why there are any non-fundamental entities in the first place. And what this is grounded upon is something called the kind instantiation principle, mm -hmm. which was put forward by Ricky Bliss. So she puts forward this principle in her work because she's trying to trying to say what work can fundamental entities do? Because mm -hmm. in the literature, a lot of people just assume foundationalism as a default position, but there's not a lot of argumentation that's been put forward. So she puts forward this this um, this principle, which says that um, even if you have um, as many dependent entities, the dependent entities cannot explain why there are any dependent entities in the first place. Mm -hmm. So dependent entities cannot explain why there are any of them in the first place. Mm -hmm. And so that's sort of in a, in a paraphrased way of the principle. She's just trying to say dependent entities do not explain why there are any of these types of entities in the first place. The right. kind depend, dependent entity is not explained by um, dependent entities themselves. Right, yeah. If you're trying to get explanation, why is there anything of this type, then pointing yes. to any one of those is yeah, obviously yeah, exactly. posterior to the fact that there exactly. is something yeah, yeah. of that type already, right? Yeah. Right. So, but then the, the issue is, is that there is a, the first, because a lot of people hadn't responded to her, um, but then there was a person called Thomas Orville um, who responded in, I think it was Philosophical Quarterly, where he actually gave a very good argument against the kind of right. Yeah. Um, so then given this sort of, um, this critique, I then said, okay, maybe I need to refine the kind of instantiation principle. And so what I do then is to say, is I, I put it within a Aristotelian context, where I say that um, if we identify the kind dependent entity as a substantial universal, so mm -hmm. universal, then the instances of that universal cannot explain why that universal exists in the first place. Right. Mm -hmm. So um, dependent entities exist because there are in, they are instances of the the substantial universal dependent entity. Mm -hmm. um, the same way that a cat exists because it's the instance of the the universal cat. Yeah. So dependent entities um, they are instances of the universal dependent entity, but um, they cannot explain why there is this universal in the first place. Now um, the problem with that, I, I felt that at that point it actually seems to clarify and, and deal with the problem that Thomas Orwell brought up. Yeah. Um, but then it brings up another issue, which is Aristotelianism, um, specifically which you find in people like David Armstrong and a few others, where they hold to this view of the principle of instantiation, yeah. that um, uh, instances of universals exist in light of the universals, but right. universals also exist in light of their instances. So that's yeah. sort of imminent realism view. Yeah. And so the problem that you have there is then if the universal is dependent upon the instance the instances, then you you cannot use this kind of saturation principle as I revised it. Because actually dependent entities can explain why there is this universal of dependent entity 
um, because that universal is dependent on the instances themselves, mm -hmm. given this principle of instantiation found within Aristotelianism. So then what I need to do then is I need to then put forward an argument why Aristotelianism um, in this specific way. So I don't reject Aristotelianism in general. But this contemporary form of this it, right. Yeah, yep. Where this principle is is a key thing, where I, where I actually say, no, I do believe that universals can be transcendent. So it's sort of, you have this platonic view is that universals can be transcendent. But it's seri it's it's um it's not a full blown um Platonism because you still need you still have these um these universals having instances and they exist in light of these instances, but they're, they're not still imminent. they're still imminent, right? Yeah, they're still imminent, they're still imminent. Um so the argument that's put forward is um sort of developing or, or borrowing from um, a person called Jose Alvarado. Yeah. Um, yeah, I like his work. Yeah, I can't yeah. read all of it because it's not all in English, but I do yeah, like his work. Yeah. <laughs> the paper that I utilize in my book, um, mm -hmm. he didn't even publish it, which was interesting. Mm -hmm. but I don't know why, because it was a very, very... I read good. that paper. It was great. Yes, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I'm, a, I'm a footnote chaser, so I was like, oh, because I hadn't yeah, seen yeah. that one before, and it was, yes, it was yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. And it was really good. So, yeah, the argument there is that you seem to have a grounding relation between universals and their instances. Um, but then you seem to have um, sort of a cycle of grounding problem yep. because, um, as we were saying, the universals exist in light of their instances, but the instances are dependent upon the universals. So it seems to be that we have problems of reflexivity. Um, um, oh, sorry, um, so we have symmetry, um, symmetrical grounding, which yep. seems to be a problem, um, and that cannot be the case. So there's a lot of arguments that goes into that, so I don't, I don't really want to bore yeah. your... your your, um, your listeners. It's it's good stuff, yeah. and I know we're kind of deep in the in the weeds here yeah. for a lot of people, but uh, you can always hit the replay button and yes, yeah. <laughs> and get Josh's book. Yeah, this exactly. is I, this I love I love this stuff because it's it, it's tricky stuff to think through, yes. but it's important it's important, right? So yeah, yes. right. Yes. So you have this cycle of priority problem. Yes. Yeah, continue. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So then, yeah, you have this problem. So you have the cycle of priority problem, and so by showing that actually, what I sort of get to the conclusion of the argument is that. Um, we should take um, our, our universals to be transcendent entities that exist. Uh, it's not the case that they have to exist necessarily, but they exist and they're transcendent. Um, but the instances are dependent upon those those universals. And so this frees then the revised kind of instantiation principle because the instances require the universal of um, dependent entity, um, but the universal dependent entity doesn't require the um the um, specific instances to exist. Mm -hmm. And so this then gives explanatory room for fundamental entities to be posited because fundamental entities can then explain why there is this universal. So I say then, whatever the fundamental entities are, um, they're the things that ground the universal of um, dependent entity. Right. So that universal is grounded in something. It's not just free floating by itself. It's mm -hmm. grounded in something, but it's not grounded in the instances. It's grounded in something which is out of that uh, that doesn't exemplify that universal and that is a fundamental entity yes great yeah so obviously that can yeah. fit well with a uh, an understanding of, of yes. theism um yeah. okay okay good all right so now all right so we could do two two things here at this point then these, these conversations are so wide and you can go in yeah. all sorts of directions you can start to make the case for theism or um you know Somebody, somebody might just 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 question the whole paradigm of of um, of realism to begin with, right? Uh, which way do you want to go, right? Because there's still a bunch of nominalists out there, right? Yes. Who you know, and uh, I, again, I thought this was an excellent section of your book. Yeah, and this is this was what I love. I'm just going to just shower some more praise upon you, Joshua, because why, I mean, why not, right? Is uh, <laughs> your book is great because you not only catch people up to speed on some. I mean, very perennial debates, right? Realism, and you know, is a per perennial debate. We also kind of like right at the edge of the literature and advancing it too, like with this this example that we just we just we just gave here of the cycle of priority problem stuff like that. So it's really it's just really well done. Uh, but why don't yeah? Why don't you give us a quick case of 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 why you why you think we need to move in the realist direction? Then we can finally show how you think theism can give the best account of of all this all this data. Yeah. Yeah, so um, I, I do believe that universals are needed for um, things like um, identity, so synchronic and diachronic identity. Um, so a lot, lot of people would say that, yeah, you can have um, tropes, you can have you know other entities that fulfill the role of universals, um, but it just doesn't seem to be the case that I think that things like um, the identity of an entity can actually be grounded in things like tropes. 
Um, so in that specific section. Yeah, but can we talk about that for a minute? Because this is yeah. another thing I have. Which, and yeah. again, there's lots of different variants yeah. of trope yeah. theory. So my thought is like, oh, man, this is going to be hard to articulate. I'll do my best, right? If yeah. So if, if, if a universal for trope theory is just like wisdom is just the, the collection of all the tropes, right? Yeah then the number of tropes has to be fixed, right? Because if it's always varying, then that's going to screw up the universal, right? Yeah. But if the number of tropes are fixed, then it seems you could easily have individuals instantiated in other individuals, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. But that's, that's, that's wrong, right? The basic mark of an individual is that which cannot be instantiated, right? That's what a universal... So, so that's out, right? Um, or you just have to give up that tropes can account for what we're looking for here and then you kind of lose that what that um that explanatory factor otherwise yeah. i just think that tro trope theory just isn't just like a form of extreme resemblance nominalism right mm -hmm. which just to me has all sorts of it just doesn't just doesn't work at all yeah. is there something else i'm missing there like trope no, theory? No, no, i'm no, really no, trying I, to think hard about what like why does trope theory fail and to me it's like one of those yeah. two one is to raise cause me to reject a trope theory. Yeah. No, I think I think you hit the nail on the head there. Well, just asking you a question, not to interview you, but um, just uh, what would your sort of view then of um, when it comes to properties? Are, are you sort of a hardline Aristotelian when it comes to it? Um, I, I do imagine you're not a Platonist and, and things like that. Yeah. So I mean, I'm, I guess I, I'd be like broadly your your scholastic realist. I I I, I like to defend. Uh, uh, constituent ontology of property instances. I think it's right to think that that we are comprised of incomplete entities that that cannot. Um, they're really distinct, but but inseparable, right? Yeah. Um, and then if you want to like have it all built out for me, I think that we make sense of universals as contained virtually in the notion of unrestricted being, which is God, okay. right? So I don't want to say they're contained formally, you know, materially, certainly not, or even eminently, yeah, yeah. but but virtually. And for a non-Christian, I think that, I don't maybe he's Christian, I don't know. Um, I really don't know. Uh, but somebody who defends this from a Neoplatonic standpoint really well, I think is Lloyd Gerson in some of, of his recent work. So I'd say I'm probably closest to to him. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. No, 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 yeah, that's interesting. But I, I think you, you hit the nail on the head there. I, I just feel like, um, tropes do not have, I don't know, the the nature of a trope just doesn't fulfill what we expect for the, what it is to be a universal. Because, I mean, the whole point is to replace the role of a universal. So a right. lot of people sort of say, you know, you don't need universals because they're weird. How can you have these multiply located entities or blah, blah, blah. Um, and then, you know, you can have these tropes that fulfill this role, but it just seems like the nature of them are not construed in such a way to actually properly fulfill the role of of a universal um and so yeah yeah for me yeah yeah um, real quick sorry just by my head but the other thing is to me it just it just seems like trope theory gets something backwards right is yeah. that like socrates wisdom the instance of wisdom derives its individuality from socrates yeah. but on trope theory it would be the other way around socrates gets his individuality from other and that just seems to me and i think i could give a more rigorous argument than seems to yeah. me but like already we're just backwards on that account right you yeah, know what i mean yeah yeah mm -hmm. Anyway, sorry, continue. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's, it's great what you say. So, yeah, I just feel that it ha lacks the explanatory power to um, help us understand things like identity, synchronic, diachronic identity. Um, and, yeah, Universal sort of fulfill that role, I would say, more substantially. Yeah. Um, I, so, if I'm honest, I don't give a very rigorous... I, I list some, some reasons why in that specific section. Just because the book itself... Um, I'll, I'll actually tell you. I'll say this to another person. The book actually... <laughs> Started off with, uh, as at three hundred and fifty thousand words, so that, yeah, yeah, it was absolutely crazy. I finished Love the book it. when I finished it um, last year. It was three hundred fifty thousand words. Mm -hmm. and I gave it to Routledge, and they were like, "We're not publishing that." So, <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, bro. <laughs> we're not publishing that. Um, and you need to cut it down. So then I, they actually wanted me to cut it down to one fifty, which was my original contract. Yeah. Um, but then I, I could only get it down to two sixty, and I gave it back to them. They actually agreed to it. And I was quite surprised with that. But they'll they'll take it off board with still with you know a hundred and a bit over the the word count, um, but yeah. So so with there's certain sections that I just had to minimally, you know, say okay, this is some yeah, um, this is some. So like for example, I was presenting uh, this argument at a recent conference in Birmingham, um, where an objection which I I feel should have featured um, uh, in that section, but it wasn't there, um, just because I just didn't have enough uh, space. But I'm, I sort of put it in a paper that. I've written. Uh, so with 
you know when I say that um, fund fundamental entities are things which can um, ground the universal of non-fundamentality or derivative or dependent entity, but then someone can easily just say, well, what? Well, then what about the universal of fundamentality? Doesn't fund don't fundamental entities require there to be something else that's grounding that to universal? Uh, so that was the objection I brought forward, and there, there's sort of two ways to deal with this problem. Mm -hmm. um, the the first way, which is a little bit of cheating, but it deals with the problem, is just to simply say that um, yes, um, it is true at the moment. Now it seems like there is a there is a need to posit a universal for fundamental entities, but then actually when you go forward to the end of the book, you realize that the only fundamental entity that exists is a trope that we mm -hmm. call God, and so tropes do not instantiate universals. So then you wouldn't need to have a universal for that specific fundamental entity. So once we've done sort of our further metaphysical sort of reasoning, we get to there being the one fundamental entity, which is the maximal power trope. But given that God is a trope, he then wouldn't have a universal that he instantiates. So everything else has universals that they instantiate, but this one trope doesn't. And so yeah. that means that you wouldn't need to have the universal of fundamentality. Mm -hmm. um, another way to take it is just to say that the identity of a fundamental entity is to be independent. So it doesn't make sense then, and this is the one I favor and I do sort of use in the in the right. book, um, that fundamental entities by their nature, by their, their essence, are independent entities. Mm -hmm. So then it doesn't make sense for a fundamental entity to have a universal that it's dependent upon. Because for something to be fundamental, it doesn't have any dependent relation to anything. Right. So um, it, it, everything depends upon it, but it doesn't depend upon anything. Uh, mm -hmm. So what that means then is that you, just from the get-go, fundamental entities are going to be things that do not um, instantiate these types of universals. They're not dependent upon them. Uh, yeah. But everything that's non-fundamental would. Yeah. 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 So that's interesting. So um, just to jam on that a little bit, it's always fun to just to, to, to jam. And by the way, I just want to say again, one thing I love about your work is you are super ambitious. Mm -hmm. And it gives it, it should give people hope because, you know, a lot of times um, – you know, that you're advised against being too ambitious in philosophy because yeah. the more ambitious you are, the more opportunities you have to be have stuff rejected, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah. But yeah. I don't like that. That's weak to me, you know? Yeah, like, come yeah. on, just go for it, man. And like, yeah, if you yeah. get rejected because you didn't trim it down, then yeah. either strengthen it up or, or whatever yeah, exactly. later. So like, I love ballsy work like this, yeah. you know what I mean, <laughs> right? And of course yeah. you can't cover everything, yeah. but like you're yeah. really trying to like close this off and it's super ambitious. I just appreciate that, you know? Yeah, no, thank you. Yeah, because I would say with that, with if you see a lot of the classical philosophers like Aquinas, Aristotle, and even like some contemporary ones, even like people like my favorite guy, Swinburne, yeah. um, they have a way of doing things where they're not, they're not just saying we need to just deal with some small problem and that that's fine. They're trying to develop metaphysical worldviews. Yeah. They're trying to say, you know, let's say, for example, theism being at the center of that worldview, but trying to explain all the data. Like, mm -hmm. that's what people like Aquinas were doing and stuff like that. And I just feel like, why do we need to be shoehorning things into specific sort of areas and, and mm -hmm. things like that? Go for what you really find interesting. Be as ambitious as possible. As long as you can provide sort of a rigorous foundation for it, then I, I don't see why people shouldn't be doing it. Um, yeah, and it's sure. nice, like, you know, I, I, you know, people can sort of see my position and say, you know, people like, uh, even like Routledge, which is a good academic press, mm -hmm. uh, they, you know, they favor some ambition. So you shouldn't be um, uh, put off by, you know, submitting things and, and going forward with, with those sort of big proposals. Yeah, yeah. And you've had a lot of success with that. So that's, in, that's inspiring. So, okay, real quick. So, I mean, the, the whole ontology thing, and I think we're, we're pretty aligned here. I guess I am, I am more of an, uh, uh, more of a, uh, uh, a traditional Aristotelian with it, and I'm happy to accept the cycle of priority problem because again I think that that makes a, a sort of bare Aristotelianism internally unstable and it actually forces you uh through a causal route to theism it's a different approach than yours mm -hmm. right I think that's that, that's one way and then I if you don't have you know uh universals kind of um existing apart from that then maybe you don't have to deal with this objection that you brought up either or if somebody is going i wouldn't go in the direction of a relational ontology because i think there's a bunch of issues with that but then if you have a relational ontology then yes. i think at the fundamental level you have a problem right um you know god is god because he has some you know a primitive exemplification of the form of divinity it seems like a dependence relation there which yes. you you yeah. don't definitely like like you said like whatever the fundamental entity is it seems like it should be absolutely 
independent. So yeah, I guess there's a couple ways of maybe just uh, getting around. I do like your approach though, too. And I felt, I felt like you did say something about that in the book. Wasn't, wasn't that in the book or maybe oh, you I can't even remember. I, I forgot it half. That doesn't sound new to me. What you just said. Yeah, so maybe, I, maybe I, you just have developed it further. But it, yeah, I, maybe I, I, I literally have so many footnotes. I, to, I can't even remember why I wrote it. <laughs> I don't even know. Yeah, <laughs> I can't remember I, what I, chapter. I read like. certain sections before yeah. I had this interview because I'm like, actually, what did I write? <laughs> Um, well, I'm, I'm the same way. My book is way shorter yeah. than yours. So yeah, no apologies there. And that's why I always like to be fair to people too, is like, yes, look, you yes. probably let everyone haven't read this recently. You know, who knows yeah. how long ago was that you wrote it? So I don't expect yes, everything yeah. to be super, you know, yeah. uh, top of mind, especially with everything else that you're doing, but man, it's impressive how much you, you can recall. All right. So let's, all right, let's just, let's just grant all this. Cause I think a lot of people are good, would be super happy to grant at least a lot of this stuff, even without yeah. argumentation. Like, yeah, realism sounds right to me. That ontology sounds right. All right. Yeah. How does this get, like, how does this help with your case for theism? Right. Yes. So let's, yes. let's finally get there. Right. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So then this, then now we take, um, we move from stage one of the methodology with foundationalism, um, in tow. So we take the foundations, foundation, foundationism framework and we filter out all the other frameworks, infinitism, coherentism, flat worldism. And it's important that we do that because a first objection, I remember when I had a conversation with Graham Moffey a long time ago, this was a, a video discussion uh, on my grounding paper. And his sort of response to that was to take the infinitist route to say, actually, maybe they're just infinite descending chains. Um, now, the, the important thing is because I deal with infinitism already, you can't take that route because stage two now of the analysis is just looking at foundationist theories. So now yeah. we've filtered out infinitism, coherentism, and flat worldism. We then move to stage two where we're now going to select the specific foundationist um, theory, which is the best explanation of the data that we're looking at. So what I do then is I put forward six specific theories that are in, um, sort of in the contemporary literature uh, concerning foundationism. So you have my trope theoretic theism on the one hand, which I've already introduced. And then we have other theories such as mon monistic substantivalism, which was put forward by Jonathan Schaffer. Uh, you have um, extended simples theory. No, sorry, mm -hmm. pure stuff theory. That's the third one. Pure stuff theory, which right. was put forward by Ned Marcosian. Uh, you have a uh, mere logical bundle theory put forward by L.A. Paul. Uh, you have extended simples theory, which is put forward by people like Chris McDaniel. Um, and then you have an ontic, ontic structural realism view, which is priority uh, priority based structural realism, mm -hmm. which is defended by people like Kerry McKenzie. So you have these six metaphysical theories. And then what I say is we then need to perform an internal and external assessment of these theories. Mm -hmm. The internal assessment is looking at the, um, the specific v virtues of the co coherential virtues and the aesthetic virtues. And then the external um, assessment is looking at the evidential virtues in light of certain evidence. So what I do in the chapter where I introduce all the theories, I perform the internal assessment. And just sort of looking at theism, theism, I, I argue, ha um, passes the internal assessment in a very, very strong manner. Because when it comes to, uh, firstly, the coherential virtues, which are three virtues that you have to look at internal consistency, internal coherence, and universal coherence. Right. Internal consistency, um, none of the attributes that I define are internally um, um, inconsistent. Mm -hmm. There is no entailment of a contradiction in any of the, the attributes I utilize, so it's internally consistent. It's internally coherent because all of the attributes of God are taken to be aspect of him. That means that they are identical to him. So God mm -hmm. is identical to all of his attributes. So God's nature is a harmonious there is no right. ad hoc supposition that's added to us. Yeah. Understanding. Yeah. Yeah. Boy, man, that, that, I, I want to talk because you you have me thinking a lot about your aspectival account and how I've thought about divine simplicity and, and yes. stuff like that. But I'm going to not chase that right yeah, now. Yeah. If we have time later, maybe we'll do it. Yes, so you yeah. keep going. Right? No, yeah. That's fine. yeah yep. So it's internally coherent because all of the attributes work together. So there's no ad hoc supposition. It's universally coherent. So universal coherence is the idea of does it fit with things within our background knowledge? Does it fit with other neighboring fields, the entity that we're putting forward? Now, again, because I put forward uh, the, uh, the concept of God as a trope, we have an entity which is found within many other ontologies outside of um, theism. Yeah. So you have people like Jonathan Schaffer himself and a lot of other people, Peter Simons and um, others, who hold to trope theoretic, um, a trope theoretic view of the world. Um, and you have tropes being used, as we were speaking about in the realism debate. We also have them being used in things like philosophy of physics. 
Um, so the key idea here is, is that tropes are things which are readily accessible and understood to be things that are positive to exist within neighboring fields. So the entity that I'm putting forward is not a wild entity. It ain't, it ain't too weird, right? Yeah. yeah, it's not too weird. So this is interesting because this diverts me from someone like Swinburne, where Swinburne will identify God as an omnipresent spirit. Now, a spirit is not something which is found in the ontologies um, of neighboring fields within metaphysics or other areas. Mm -hmm. So you have that problem of fitting with that background knowledge. But because I take on to be a trope, that's not an entity which will say, okay, no, I can't stomach that type of thing. Yeah. Now, what, remind me of what Swinburne's response that is again. Does he just say it just doesn't matter that much? Yeah, right? I, yeah. I'm honest. Um, I, 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 yeah, I haven't seen Swinburne respond to that specific problem. Because I think he would say, um, because he's a, a substance dualist, yeah, um, he would not have a problem with there being a soul and there being, um, you know, a physical body, and so he just takes God to be, let's say, in a way, an unembodied soul. Um, sure. He uses the term spirit, um, yeah. so it's just sort of that thing. So I think he won't have a problem because you'll say actually, um, all of everyone is, you know, has a soul inside of them. So yeah. God is just one who does, just doesn't need a body. Right. And so I think that will be his sort of uh, viewpoint. But again, that will be grounded upon substance dualism being readily you know affirmed by other people in other ontologies which and that's obviously a yeah. highly contentious yes, yes yeah, exactly. thing, right? yeah so yeah so you have all of the coherential virtues being affirmed and mm -hmm. um, uh, exemplified by trope theoretic theism and then the key ones now in our internal assessment are the aesthetic virtues mm -hmm. so the aesthetic virtues are three virtues you have beauty you have simplicity and you have unification beauty is just how um it's, it's a bit of a, a i would say a very superficial virtue um, but it's just a virtue that says um, if you have a properly functioning person, would they take your theory to be beautifully uh, constructed? Okay, that's yeah. one of the, the things. That so which, when seen, pleases. Right? Yes, yeah, that sort of thing. But but what um what Keys does with this specific virtue, he then reduces it to simplicity and, and unification. So something is beautiful if it is simple and it is unified. Sure. Um, mm -hmm. So that you sort of don't need to worry about the beauty um, one. Yeah. You just have to look at simplicity. Yes. So simplicity um, is the idea that you have a very, um, you have a, a theory that posits quantitatively the fewest number of entities, qualitatively the fewest number of kinds or ontological categories of entities. Um, and then unification is where you have a single posit which is able to unify disparate areas of knowledge. Yeah. So if we have a, a single thing that can unify many areas or many theor theoretical postulations. So what I argue is that theism of a trope theoretic kind has sim simplicity to the highest extent. Because what we're positing is a single entity, so that's quantitatively simple, but an entity that has no properties. So normally when we say quantitative simplicity, we're saying, does it have the fewest number of entities? That means objects, properties, relations. Now, when we come to trope theoretic theism, we're positing a single entity who has zero properties, because right. all of the attributes that we predicate of God are identical to him. They're that's aspects right. of God. They're not yep. properties. Mm -hmm. So we have a single entity who um, is... Um, who exemplifies uh, zero properties. And then when we go to qualitative simplicity, we have this entity not falling, not um, instantiating any kinds. So we don't, at the fundamental level, have to postulate any kinds at all. Because mm -hmm. tropes don't, as I said before, they don't instantiate kinds, where, where kinds are understood to be universals. Yeah. What we have here is then an entity that is a single entity um, who has zero properties and is of zero kinds. So you have the simplest type of entity that you can put forward. And then this entity, because of his maximal power, any postulation that you put forward is able to be unified under him. So anything that you put forward with God, because he's limited only by logic in the exercising his power, anything that we put forward, anything that he intentionally brings about is going to be a harmonious, unified postulation. So mm -hmm. we have a single entity who's able to unify everything that is going to exist within the reality that he grounds. Mm -hmm. So what we have here is theism being of the trope theoretic kind, being... Um, one, which is a coherent theory, so it has all the coherential virtues, and it minimizes theoretical commitments because it's a simplest theory, having no, having um, qualitative and quantitative simplicity, and it unifies all theoretical postulations. Mm -hmm. And so we have all of the three virtue classes being um, exemplified by theism already. Now it's just the last one is the evidential virtue class, and that's where we look at the um, external assessment. Yeah, great. Okay, so I obviously don't expect you to uh, go through the assessment for all the other competitors as well. But is there anything you just kind of want to say by yeah, way of just, summary just, when we're looking? Yeah, so I'll, yeah. I'll go with um, I'll go with two 
uh, one from each camp. So you have um, the way I defy, divide foundationalism is you have monistic foundationalism and you have pluralistic foundationalism. Right. Monistic foundationalism is where you posit a single fundamental entity. Plur pluralistic foundationalism is where you say there are many fundamental entities. Sure. Mm -hmm. So within the, the um, monistic camp, you have my pluralistic theism, but you also have monistic sub uh, sub substantivalism, mm -hmm. um, where it is the idea that put forward by Schaffer that you have the universe or the cosmos being the single fundamental entity where all the other um, things that exist are proper parts of the universe. Yeah. So um, what I then do with this internal assessment of this theory is to say that it seems to, I'll, I'll leave the coherential virtues for because I'll take a bit too long, but just looking at the aesthetic virtues, um, specifically simplicity, you have it being a very complex theory because even though you have a single entity, you have a single entity who has a near infinite amount of properties because yeah. Um, what Schaffer says is that every object is identified as a spatio-temporal region of the mm -hmm. cosmos. So we are all spatio-temporal regions, and each of our properties are, are pinned on the cosmos itself. Mm -hmm. So the cosmos actually directly instantiates all the properties that we as objects have. So mm -hmm. that means then all the, just think about the, the near infinite amount of objects that exist as spatio-temporal regions of the universe, all the properties that that universe is going to have to, to, um, to, to instantiate you're right. going to have a near infinite amount of properties. Mm -hmm. And then also, when it comes to qualitative simplicity, you have it being a substance attribute distinction at the fundamental level. I don't have to posit any sort of ontological categories in those ways. We have substance and att um, attributes because you have, at the fundamental level, there being um, the universe, and then it, um, it instantiates all of, it, all of its properties. So then you have to posit um, two ontological categories. You then also have to posit it being something which instantiates a kind. So what you have is quali more qualitatively complex theory than one of trope theoretic theism, which doesn't have to have those ontological categories and doesn't have to have those kinds of instantiates. So yeah. you have that problem, yeah. And just uh, quickly with um, the pluralistic uh, form, you have um, something like one of the examples I give is mirrorological bundle theory, which is another theory there, where it's put forward by L.A. Paul that all of the fundamental things in the fundamental level of reality are qualitative properties. So everything is constructed from properties, these qualitative things. So um, instead of the universe being the fundamental thing, the single thing, we have all of these small little properties which construct everything. Now, obviously, again, when we're looking at the aesthetic virtues, we can see that it's going to fail when it comes to right. quantitative simplicity and it comes to qualitative simplicity. So you have the similar type of problem. Um, but I don't just, I won't go through it now, but we don't just look at, I don't just look at um, j just the aesthetic virtues, but in the book itself, I go through coherential and it's quite yeah. tedious for the reader. Um, <laughs> hey, if, but if you're into that sort of thing, it's great. Yeah, yeah it's But like, I go, because I, I really want to go as rigorous as be possible. Be thorough, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. That's what I love about exactly. it. Yeah. I'm trying to show that actually, I'm not just favoring theism in, as the internally best theory, um, but actually all the other theories do not fulfill the virtues. Right, yeah, they really we, they really have these marks against them. I agree, and yeah. you did a great job with that. Uh, now, just for people, again, just yeah. by way of reminder, sometimes, you know, these, these virtues are like the tiebreaker you know, ones, right? Because what, what really matters is like, can you explain the stuff, right? Yeah. Um, uh, so it's like, okay, if all the, if the series all explain the stuff equally well, then maybe we'll look towards simplicity or yeah. something like that, yeah. right? But you're already showing, okay, that you're, even if you think of it as a, as the, as the tie break, the, you know, a tiebreaker, uh, you're not going to have that available, which is, which is certainly useful. So let's get to the explanation yeah. And just, I just want to reiterate for people who are not familiar with your book, like this is just one section of the book. And Josh uses this methodology across a lot of different, really fascinating, you know, features of reality, metaphysical features of reality. So just if you kind of understand the method at play here, you can, and maybe we can just tease a few of those later. But for now, let's, let's get to the, uh, you know, um, explanation. Yes. Here, if you don't mind, yeah. yeah, so then this then moves into what I call the external assessment, where I'm going to look at these six theories in light of certain um, evidences that can be put forward from metaphysics. Now, the way that I call, what I call these evidences to be um, are elements of non-fundamental reality. Yeah. So now, if you remember, I was saying in stage one, the first evidence is that of it appearing to be uh, the case that there are non-fundamental entities within reality. Now, given that there are these non-fundamental entities within reality, what are the features of what is the features of this non-fundamental reality? And I believe that there are six elementary features of this non-fundamental reality. So I call them six elements. Mm -hmm. So this is I have the physical element, 
the temporal element, the ontological element, the relational element, mm. the personal element, and the experiential element. Mm -hmm. So I try and say, um, let's take all of these six uh, foundationalist theories and see if which one best explains these um, elements of reality. So I right. go each chapter bit by bit, going through the physical elements reality, which focuses on quantum mechanics yep. um, and certain things within that. And then I say which one best explains it. And obviously, I'm going to argue that theism does. Um, and then when, when I go to the temporal element, this is looking specifically at four dimensionalism. So the idea that there are three spatial dimensions and then a fourth dimensional time. Mm -hmm. um, and then I also look at, um, within that area, I look at ex um, um, exduantism, which is the idea of, uh, it's a theory within persistence. Mm -hmm. So a lot of people might know about endurantism um, and perdurantism, but there's also another view called exduantism. Um, and so I look at that as well, and I take that on as uh, part of being uh, part of the temp temporal elements reality. So we have with the physical elements reality, we have the quantum mechanics, specifically the wave function existing mm -hmm. in a higher dimension of space. And then the next uh, bit, of, the next element of reality is that. Um, so sorry, just to rewind, we have the wave function existing in um, a high dimensional space, and we exist within another type of space. Okay, that's what mm -hmm. a lot of people are arguing for in the foundations of quantum mechanics. But there's this wave function that exists in this configuration space, which is a high dimensional space. And it has a relation to things like us, macro and microscopic objects existing within another type of space. So then I then move on to uh, the temporal elements of reality. And I identify this space as a four dimensional, um, four dimensional reality, four right. dimensional space. So this moves from the wave, wave function to then the four dimensional space. And then I say within this four dimensional space, we have persisting entities. We have entities, whatever it is, that are existing um, at different times and they exist through ex durance. Okay. And so I say, I take that on as the temporal element of reality. Mm -hmm. Then I move on to the ontological element of reality. And I say these entities fall into, all of these ent persisting entities fall into four ontological categories. So that looks at EJ Lowe's four ontological categories, right. and they have essences, which is what we've been talking about, yeah. right? Yeah, so that is then, yeah, that is the ontological element of reality. Yep. And then I move on to the relational element, and I say um, these entities, which fall into these categories and have essences, are related together by relations of grounding, and they have powerful qualities which enable them to stand in causal relations. So mm -hmm. that's sort of the relational element of reality. And then I move on to the personal elements reality, which says these entities um, are taken to be um, objects, uh, specifically in a near, near Aristotelian way. They are they are structured holes and mm -hmm. substances, and they are and certain type um, a certain amount of these substances are um, are persons who have free will. So then I move mm -hmm. into the free will discussion. Yeah, that was that's great. Yeah, mm -hmm. and then the last yeah then the last elements reality, which is the experiential one, is saying these entities which are persons they experience suffering mm -hmm. so that's an element of reality which needs to be accounted for so what you can see is i have a very wide scope i start off with with the wave function i then move on to our dimension of reality and the entities existing within it then i narrow into the categories and the essences that they have then i go into their relations that they have to each other uh, causal and grounding relations then I try to identify what the nature of these entities are, with them being substances um, that are structured holes, and some of them being persons. And then I say, at the most narrow level, these persons, a lot of these persons, have um, uh, suffering experiences. Mm -hmm. And so I say, this is the metaphysical structure of reality that I put forward. Mm -hmm. And then I say, what best explains each of these elements? And I, I believe that trope theoretic theism has the best um, explanatory power for it. Yeah, yeah. And of course, you spent a lot of time making that case. Um, but give us, yeah, what would be the best way to to summarize it? I know that's asking yeah. a lot here, right? Yeah. But um, yeah, let's give it a shot. Yeah, so, okay. so when we have these six elements, six elements of reality, mm -hmm. okay, um, and I, I make sure as well, because one of, I try to ward off a lot of objections. Um, it might be the, the quietness in me, uh, where you're always thinking of what someone might be saying before they say it. Yep. Um, but a lot of people would say, um, why should I take on these elements as data? Because at the end of the day, when you're using inference in the best explanation, you're trying to account for data. Right, and so I yeah. make sure, and I, it might be that book that you're talking about, uh, The Moral Universe. Is that with um, uh, Schaffer Landau? That's well? right. And Cuneo, yeah, yeah, yeah. right? Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So it's the, the it's a, is that the second volume or is it, because I know it's a, it's a, this is brand new. I mean, I just got my copy. I think it was published 
maybe last year. Yeah. Um, yeah. So there is there is there is one that I think um, there's it's either that one or it's the one before it. I can't I can't remember which what the name of it was, um, where they try and put forward an idea of what it what it means for something to be data, because a lot of uh, uh, people, if you're speaking to an atheist, they'll be like, oh, this is not data. Where is the scientific evidence you're talking about? Right. Like take moral facts or truth. Yes, is that yeah. is that data? So, right. Well. Yeah. So what what they say at the most basic level is that data is anything that we have reasons to believe at the onset of our inquiry. Yes. So if we have certain reasons to believe this, then we can take them on as data at the onset of our inquiry. So what I do then is saying, we have reasons to believe the wave function exists, four-dimensionalism is true, durantism is true, four-category ontologies, all of these things are true, um, and so we can take them on, on as data. But then, given that these things are metaphysical data, what it best explains it. And what I'm arguing for is that when you take theism, the idea that there is a maximal power trope, and a maximal power trope is one who can perform any possible action, um, and also from that, he's maximally good, he's perfect, he's maximally free, all of those sort of things are sort of entailed from that. Um, and you take on certain axiological principles, so principles about goodness. Yes. So I take on three principles. Uh, the goodness principle, I, I call it the goodness principle, diffusiveness principle and yeah. the principle of plenitude yeah i really it, love that you're, yeah. you're bringing those traditional principles back into yes. the conversation a few other people have like kretzmann and like a little bit but man like they just seem like great and true yes. principles to me but they have somewhat been forgotten you know yes exactly exactly so what i say is is that for all of the six theories that i look at they all have so in that section i introduce them they all have governing principles yeah so uh, for example, monistic substantialism has certain fundamentality principles, things like priority monism, and it has something called the tiling constraint. So they have these principles that are governing them. And I say trope theoretic theism has certain principles that we all affirm concerning axiology. And so we have these three principles, the goodness principle. It's the idea that um, basically the most basic level, everything has certain value. Every single thing has a certain amount of goodness. Uh, the second one, um, diffusiveness, is that goodness diffuses itself. Um, necessarily. And the third one about plenitude is that goodness, um, uh, sorry, it's good to uh, bring about as many potentials as possible, um, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So given those principles and given the entity that I posit, we then will expect, for example, the wave function. So just to maybe we can camp our, our tent with the, the physical element of reality. Sure. Mm -hmm. So um, just for people to understand, because quantum mechanics is I think there's a famous phrase, I can't remember who said it, who said, if you think you understand quantum mechanics, you, you do don't, right, yeah. <laughs> so, so what I'm telling you is the most basic level, um, but uh, what I do, what I will say about quantum mechanics is what David Wallace said, and I quoted it at the beginning of it, is that it is the most um, scientifically grounded theory in contemporary science. So it is the, the, it is the central theory for a lot of working theoretical physicists. So anyways, quantum mechanics um, is, you know, at the most basic level for, for the listeners, is focusing on the sort of small things of reality. Mm -hmm. um, but when you're doing that, you face certain problems. And there are two problems that, that a lot of um, scientists and specifically philosophers of physics are facing. The first one is called the measurement problem. Mm -hmm. And the second one's called the ontological problem. Now, the ontological problem is just the idea of what do we posit when we posit our theories um, that try to deal with the measurement problem. Mm -hmm. So we try to deal with the measurement problem, we put forward certain theories. What ontological theories do we put forward to try and explain um, the, the data that we're looking at? Yeah. Um, okay, so the measurement problem is the key one, and that's the, the um, idea that you have something called the wave function. And the wave function is normally taken to be a mathematical tool that expresses the possible configurations of a quantum system. Mm -hmm. for the, the possible configurations, uh, which could be things to do with position, uh, to do with momentum, to do with um, certain things related to that. And the wave function sort of allows us to understand and predict how those sort of things are going to operate. Um, now, there is something called wave function realism, where individuals believe that the wave function is actually a physical entity. Mm -hmm. So it's a physical thing that actually exists, but it doesn't exist within our own spatial realm as such. Mm -hmm. It exists in another spatial realm called a configuration space. So it exists in a high, high dimensional space. And it has, let's say we have our space here and we have this high dimensional space here. There is a relationship to our space in that the wave function is the thing that grounds all of the microscopic and macroscopic um, objects as well. So the mm -hmm. wave function is really the fundamental thing grounding everything else. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and so um, ontologically, the wave function is taken to be this field. Now, yeah. Fundamental um, thing in physical reality. Yes, in physical reality. Yeah, yes, right. yes. 
um, that grounds all of these things. Yeah. Now, um, the problem that you have when it comes to the measurement problem is that the wave function seems to operate in a very weird way. Because whenever we are performing a, me a measurement or, or, or observation, the wave function instead of the wave, um, the wave function instead of it being spread out, it seems to take on a determinate state. So you have, for example, Schrodinger's cat example, um, if uh, some people understand that, um, or you have the two, um, the double slit experiment, um, where you seem to have this thing of when there's an observation made, um, you don't have the wave function being spread out. Now, now the spread outness of the wave function is called a superposition. Mm -hmm. So the idea that um, for anything, they, they have, um, uh, let's say, for example, you go with an electron and you have something like a spin. So you have spin up and spin down. Mm -hmm. um, the, the thing that you're looking at will be in a spin up state and a spin down state. But when um, it's been observed, it takes a determinate state, either spin up or spin down. Yeah. So prior to observation, you have this. Now, Schrodinger gave this, sorry, not to get into the weeds now. Um, no, so this is great. Yeah. Um, but yeah, Schrodinger, who was one of the progenerate generators of uh, quantum mechanics he tried to um give this example as a joke to sort of say how weird is quantum mechanics because let's say you have a cat and you have um, a particle um and you have a um you have a, a counter and you have a um a vial of poison and if the the particle sort of de decomposes then it will cause the um the counter to switch and to the poison to be uh, let off and the cat to die um but if it doesn't then the cat will be alive now, prior to um, us opening the box, the cat will actually have to be dead and alive because it's going to have to be in a superposition state because the particle is going to have to be uh, decomposed or not decomposed because it has a superposition. So the cat will then have to be dead and be alive. Mm -hmm. But then when we open up the box, we never see the superposition. We just see the cat being either dead and or, or alive. alive. Right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So we have this problem within physics of saying, why does it happen that you have prior to observation superpositions and then after observation you have there being this determinate state so you have um, many interpretations that have been put forward i'm not going to go into depth about them you yeah. have them, which is the copenhagen interpretation which sort of just bites the bullet and says yeah it just happens and you just say shut up shut up basically <laughs> that's what they say um you have uh, the many worlds view any worlds where, right yeah. yeah you know, sort of have the branching of the the wave function um, yeah. with multiple universes uh, so you have different explanations now what I do then is saying, let's say we take that there is this wave function existing in the high dimensional space and we have it collapsing um, at observation. What best explains these two things? The existence of the wave function and it's, um, the event of its collapse. So I look at trope theoretic theism, I look at um, all of the other theories, the other five theories and their principles and say, what best explains this happening? Well, given that um, there is a maximum power trope, and this maximal power trope will understand the principles of the goodness principle, the axolo the um, diffusion principle, the principle of plenitude, then we can expect there to be a wave function. Because, for example, when it comes to the principle of, um, sorry, the goodness principle, um, goodness is tied to complexity. So that means the more complex an entity is, the more value it has. Now, this doesn't mean, by the way, uh, when it comes to simplicity and stuff like that. Um, but this is just sort of at the, we're talking about physical objects here. The more um, complex a physical object is, the more value it seems to have. Um, that's why we'll, we'll value, for example, a computer more than a rock. Um, this seems to have more complex uh, constituents. So the idea here is, is that the wave function is one of the most complex entities that can exist uh, because it's a thing which, number one, expresses all of the possible configuration states of every single thing that exists within the universe, um, and also it grounds all of these things. So it has a high amount of complexity. So there's good reason, just given the goodness principle, that God will want to um, bring this about. The diffusing the principle as well, because the wave function diffuses existence throughout all of space, it's also something, again, that God will want to bring about, because goodness, sorry, existence is a good thing, and mm -hmm. to diffuse it in that type of way is a good thing. And also plenitude. Um, because the, the wave function brings about all possible states because of its superposition, we'll expect it, it brings about all the potentialities of that state. Um, of, of the states of, of, um, of the quantum system. So we expect God to want to bring about that type of thing as well, given these principles. So we seem to have good reason to believe if there is a God and these principles are at work governing axiology, then God will want to bring about something like the wave function. Yeah, they have this broad anticipation of something like yes. this, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, and then also, uh, when we then look at the event of the collapse of the wave function, why would God want to bring this about? Well, God will want to bring it about because if everything was in a superposition state at the microscopic level, this will then trigger up to everything being in a superposition state at the macroscopic level. So, for example, like the cat example, 
um, the cat has to be in a suitable position state, not just the particle, but the cat also has to be in it. And so because you have something, I, I, um, not to go into depth, you have something called decoherence in quantum mechanics, where sort of um, the environment becomes entangled with, um, with um, the particles and, and some atomic particles. So everything ends up being in a superposition state. Um, so this, so pe this is why a lot of people, a lot of people favor the many worlds interpretation yeah. because everything's in the superposition state. You put one of those uh, positions in one world, and you put another position in the other. In world. another world, right? Um, yeah. I don't want to. You don't want to stomach the many worlds position. Um, so let's say everything's in a superposition state. Why would God want to collapse it when it comes to observation? Well, we have good reasons. The first reason is sci scientific knowledge. Because if everything was in a superposition state, we would not have predictability. We won't have any way to actually observe how things operate. Um, yeah. But where if God collapses it, then every time I perform an experiment or every time there's an observation or every time something's occurring, then there's a possibility of someone being able to um, um, occur that data and then utilize it in a scientific experiment. Um, so that increases our knowledge. Uh, secondly, when it comes to free will, um, if you think about it, if everything was in a superposition state, I wouldn't have the ability to choose between one thing and another. You can only choose between one thing and another because after you've chosen it, or I'll, I'll say significant free will, because after you've chosen it, that other option is it still available. So if the cat is dead and the cat is alive, I can't choose for the cat to be dead or the cat to be alive. You understand what I mean? So the key idea here is if everything trickles up into a superposition, um, and it's never collapsing the wave function, then you wouldn't have the freedom of will or you wouldn't have significant moral responsibility. Mm -hmm. So you have here, again, God guided by the axiological principles. You have God wanting to collapse a wave function because it will, it will bring about a world that you like where there is um, an ability to acquire knowledge and there is ability also to, um, to uh, have responsible creatures. So yeah. there's good reasons for this occurring within a theistic framework that I put forward. But then not to go through all the other ones, but I basically say there is no good reason given the theory of monistic substantialism, for example, um, and the principles that govern it to expect there to be a wave function and to expect there to be the collapsing of the wave function. Because, for example, um, monistic substantialism only takes there to be one type of space, which is occupied by the universe. It doesn't posit another higher dimensional space. Yeah. So we should expect there to be a higher dimensional space where there is the wave function. So there's no good reason to believe that. And there's no good reason then to also believe that given that there is this universe, that there should be any collapsing when it comes to measurement. There's no good, there's no expectation by affirming that theory. And so I walk through in that same way with all the other theories to say there is no good expectation to expect there to be this physical element of reality, which is the wave function and its collapse. But you can expect it within trope theoretic theism. So we have good reason to believe that we have the evidential virtues being fulfilled when it comes to um theism but we don't have that for the other ones as well so it passes the external assessment relative to this specific data yeah so it, it, it i mean at the end of the day your case is first off that's absolutely fascinating and I, we're both just for the gentle listeners josh and i are both on a bit of a time crunch so sorry if i feel like speed <laughs> trying to get through as much as i can before you have to close uh, close this off uh but you are making of course this cumulative case at the end of the day theism just explains the most with the least yeah. right um and I think it is an extremely powerful case. I mean, jo Joshua, you and uh, certain other people have shifted me. I mean, even for my own book, you know, I was always kind of like, you know, very attracted to the traditional metaphysical approach. You go out, you carve reality at its joints, yeah. and then you say, hey, as a necessary condition for all this stuff, you need that absolutely simple first principle. Your methodology is more contemporary. It's different. Um, and I certainly don't think that they're compa incompatible. I mean, in my book, I kind of divide it in, in two. I say, look, you can take the traditional metaphysical approach, and this actually gives you a very metaphysically informed conception of God, right? So I don't start off with my hypothesis. I, I work it through the traditional metaphysical way. But then what I do is similar to you. I say, okay, maybe that med traditional approach didn't totally convince you, but it at least gives us a philosophically informed picture of God. Let's see how well it anticipates and explains everything else and if it exhibits these. So you were a big inspiration for that, of, of kind of like bringing me over to see the value in this type of methodology. It's also, I think it resonates with people because it's sort of how a lot of uh, people think in a modern scientific context, which is great, which is which right. It's extremely fruitful. And you're showing how this 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 can be applied in the metaphysical context 
Before we before we go, because uh, obviously again, there's there's so much more that we we could discuss, and you know maybe in a couple months I'll bug you to do a part two on this. Uh, g- give us give us whatever summary thoughts you you, you want at this point, Josh, because I, I know it's always yeah. podcasts like these. You don't don't want to you know it's like you know ten minutes afterwards like oh I forgot to say this yeah. or I forgot yeah. to say that right. There's so yeah. much here, so just I want to give you a little space to just yeah, yeah. insert whatever you know, last little things you, you want to do here before we tell people where to get this fine volume. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. So, yeah. Um, so with, yeah, with my sort of case I'm putting forward, I'm just trying to, again, use the methods sort of being inspired by Swinburne in this way, at least to sort of take the best uh, that's offering offered in philosophy and try to show that actually when we do take the best in philosophy, we don't have to be scared of it because you normally have the, you know, some, you know, when you're younger, old oh, philosophies, you know, Misha and all those, you know, all these horrible, you know, these figures, and I'm going to lose my These ghouls. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but actually, um, there's so much, and I, I think people have, some people have used the phrase, like, it's the golden age of metaphysics, and, and also the golden age of philosophy of religion, because there's so much fruitful work that's been doing, that done, sorry, such as, like, the rediscovery, in a way, in sort of the contemporary fel- uh, realm, of stuff like essences and stuff yeah, like that. Yeah, Aristotle's and, revenge, baby. Yeah, right? those yeah. sort of things. So, so actually, there's so much good work that's been done. And so what my sort of role here, what I was trying to do with the book, was saying, let's say we take this best philosophy, this best metaphysics, and we utilize a ready, robust um, methodology that's utilized within sci- the scientific realm with inference and the best estimation. And we, we look at the best theories on offer in metaphysics. Where, what, where can we actually lay, you know, uh, set up our tent? Where can we actually say the best fundamental theory of reality is? And so given that I look through all these different elements of reality and we take we can indeed take them on as data and we see that trope theoretic theism or theism in general, that explains this data. Mm-hmm. So then we can actually say we have good reason based upon not just the cosmological, teleological and other evidences that we put forward for a long time, but actually from metaphysics itself, we have good grounds to say that there is a God. And one thing I do conclude with in the, in the book is the idea of God being in a way, sidelined within metaphysical dis- discussions. So what I do with the introductory passage, uh, the introductory chapter as well, is try and map out a history of saying, actually in the past, in the classical era, when you have people like Aquinas and that, um, there was no philosophy of religion. Philosophy of religion was just metaphysics. That's right, they, they, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so they, they were doing their metaphysical theorizing within sort of a theistic or theological um, sort of framework. Um, but then you have a division that, that comes, a compartmentalization, of different fields where you have metaphysics and there's no room for God. God is in the philosophy of religion area and mm-hmm. he has nothing to say in metaphysics. And so what I'm trying to say is actually no, um, not just that we have a good argument for God's existence, we have good reasons to take God to be at the center of our the- theoretical um, postulations within metaphysics itself. Yeah. Because when we look at grounding, when we look at um, powers, when we look at essences or look at categories or look at the wave function, uh, what is the fundamental thing that grounds them all? My argument is God. And so yeah. theism cannot be left out of the discussions when we're looking at these sort of meta metaphysical um, ideas. And, and actually to say, no, it needs to be part of the, the conversation as well. It needs to be put back on the table. And so that's one of the conclusions I want to say uh, that, that I wanted to sort of emphasize in the book itself, that, you know, we can forget about Hume, we can forget about Kant, and we have good reasons to believe in God. And good reasons to see God at being the center of um, the metaphysical structure of reality. Yeah, beautiful, beautiful statement. I strongly agree with it. Again, I cannot recommend your book enough, Joshua. And I just want to say one final word here. Um, yeah, this is a dense book. It's a challenging book, but I want to encourage people to get it. You know, yeah, I've always seen philosophy sort of like you know, I have a, my background is music too. There's there's always those pieces that are just hard. How do you get through them? You just start. You just start, and that's how you get better. You take on, like, sometimes people shy away from the tough stuff because they're like, I don't have a degree. Just go for it. Yeah, so what if you don't understand a lot of it first? Just keep going, and you will be challenged by it. And that, it's like weight training, right? How do I get to the next weight? You lift the next weight, right? How do I get That's what you yeah. do, right? So yeah. don't shy away from this tough stuff. If you want to get good at it, go into it. Don't worry if you if you don't understand 95% of it, right? That's okay. Everybody everybody starts there. I don't know. Do you have a bit of advice for people on that front? Yeah. Maybe we could yeah, just I, finish with that, right? Yeah. yeah. I think your analogy is really good. I think because a lot of people do some sort of some type of fitness training that can be running or weight training or whatever. Yeah. And it's always going to be the initial start is the hardest thing. 
Mm-hmm. Um, and you have sort of the, the devil on your shoulder saying, oh, just give up. There's no reason. It's so hard. Don't bother. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Don't bother. But when you continue doing it, when you continue running or you continue weight training, you continue doing it, it becomes slightly easier. Your body adapts and it's able and you have a hunger to do it. And you just it just becomes second nature. And it just you know becomes it's so easy or a lot easier than what it was before. It'll still be a challenge, but it's a lot easier than, than it was in the beginning. And this is the same with any type of academic study. Um, when you're reading, uh, you know, a, 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 a difficult work at the beginning, it's going to be hard. Um, but I would just say persevere through it um, as much as possible. Take small. You don't have to read all of it in, you know, in a setting or one whole chapter. And it also, I, I struggled myself when I was doing my, my proofing of it. So, you know, read it. It took me quite a while to even get through it itself just to, to read it. Um, but I would say piecemeal, piece, um, piece by piece, uh, the more you just continue to just go forward, you'll sort of develop that attitude towards um, understanding how sort of uh, metaphysical thinking is done and metaphysical concepts work. Um, and I'll also say, you know, utilize, um, you know, we're, we're in a great um, uh, you know, sort of place at the moment where we have, you know, resources online to help define certain terms that might not have been defined. I'm not, I wouldn't say I'm the best writer at all. Uh, I'm no J.K. Rowling or, or George Martin or whatever. Um, but if you have problems with it, um, I'll be happy to ever, you know, explain terms if anyone had to send me an email or just go online and maybe research and say, actually, you know, what does it mean for the wave function or what is this area? Mm-hmm. But I would say anything in life, perseverance is the key. And the more you do it, the easier it'll become. And hopefully people will see the value in that that book as well. Yeah. Awesome. Hey, uh, last thing, where's the best place to uh, get a copy and how do people yeah. keep up with what you're doing? Yeah. So I, I would probably, it, it depends. Um, so obviously we have Amazon and we have, um, you know, the other ones where um, I don't really know in America where, where all the different Amazon, yeah. Mm-hmm. But yeah, the Amazon will be the key one. Um, I would say it, it's quite a pricey volume, but it's a lot cheaper to get um, ebook format. Um, which I think is about, it's still pricey for an ebook, but it's, it, hopefully people can manage it. I think it's 25 to 30 pounds for an ebook. Um, at the hard copy itself is more pricey, but if people have, you know, Santa's wish list, maybe they can ask them for, for, for that copy. Uh, but yeah, I'll say Amazon and sort of any other good bookstore. Hopefully, you should have it. Yeah. Excellent. Joshua, so, uh, so great to chat with you as always. Thank you so much yeah, for being thank here. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. I appreciate it.